we are now going to look at the free cash flow method. And using this model, we are going to calculate the present value of our future cash flows, and we use our weighted average cost of capital as the discount rate. Now, once again, guys, I have included steps, so I want you to study the steps, and as I work through the example, I'm going to show you how these steps work. However, I don't just want you to learn steps without understanding where they come from. So step one is to calculate the adjusted weighted average cost of capital. So obviously we need the weighted average cost of capital because we are using that as our discount rate in order to calculate the present value of our future cash flows. Then in step two, you are going to calculate your future cash flows and a continuing value. I'll discuss that in more detail when we get to step two. And then lastly, in step three, we are going to wrap everything up and calculate our value. Now, please note, when we are using this model, we only ever look at future cash flows. Any past or current cash flows are ignored. So you only include future cash flows or forecast information in your calculation. That is extremely important. When can this method be used? First, the company must be a going concern if we use this method. Second, we need to be able to estimate or forecast our free cash flows reliably. So if we can't calculate our future free cash flows, then we can't use this method. And that should make sense because we are trying to calculate the present value of our future cash flows. So if we can't estimate those cash flows reliably, then we can't use this method. And lastly, the company must have a stable capital structure allowing the use of a single discount rate. And once again, think about this logically. We use the WAC as our discount rate when we are calculating the present value. So we are using a single discount rate. So because of that, the company must have a stable capital structure. Now, this model is preferred for majority valuations. So if we are valuing a controlling interest, however, it can also be used for a minority valuation, but then we need to adjust for owner level or shareholder differences. So if we are valuing a minority interest, we will then need to deduct a minority discount. And then lastly, please also note that this method is the most technically sound method. So this is the best method that we can use to value a company. Because we are not looking at past earnings, but instead we are calculating the value based on the cash flows we expect the company to have in the future. So it's the best valuation method that we can use. Obviously, one of the limitations of this method is there's a lot of subjectivity when it comes to trying to forecast those future cash flows. We are now going to jump forward to the example, and as I work through that example, I will come back and show you how to apply these steps to any given situation. So remember, you must study these steps and you use them as a framework in all questions that you attempt. So in this example, we have information about Avery PTY Limited. So once again, we are dealing with a private unlisted company.
And the company manufactures cardboard boxes and now one of the top performers in this segment of the market. You have been approached to assist in preliminary negotiations for the sale of a 30% equity interest in Avery Limited to Wilson Limited. So we need to value a 30% equity interest. So we are valuing a minority interest. The shares are currently held by the directors of Avery Pty Limited, and you've been provided with extracts of the latest statement of financial position and statement of comprehensive income for the year just ended, as well as financial forecasts for the next three years. So please note, I said to you already, we are trying to calculate the present value of our future cash flows. So we only include future cash flows or forecast information in our calculations. So we won't be looking at the current information, only the forecast information. You have recently completed a financial analysis of Avery Pty Limited, and you have ascertained the following. Market returns are 18%, the risk-free rate is 9%, and the beta coefficient is 1.5. So that is my market return, that is my risk-free rate, and that is my beta. So I've got enough information over here to calculate my cost of equity using the capital asset pricing model. We then have current and forecast statements of financial position for Avery Pty Limited at the 30th of June, obtained from the management accounts. So the current information for 20x6 and forecast information for the next three years. Statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income of Avery Pty Limited for the years ending 30 June. Once again, current and forecast information. You may assume the following for the purposes of your valuation of Avery Pty Limited. The corporate income tax rate is 28%. They have a target debt to equity ratio of 2 is to 3. Cash flows are expected to grow at 14% from 20x9 onwards. The current market value of investments is 2.2 million rand. The current market value of long-term borrowings is 5.2 million rand. And the interest rate on similar long-term borrowings is 15%. Now, please remember from our lecture on cost of capital, if this is the rate on similar long-term borrowings, that is going to be the cost of debt. All right, so that's all of the information that we've been provided with. We are now going to work through the steps. So if I go back to the steps that I provided you with, in step one, we need to calculate our adjusted weighted average cost of capital. Now, we have already covered the calculation of the weighted average cost of capital when we looked at our lecture on cost of capital. So I'm going to refer you back to your cost of capital lecture notes for this calculation. However, please note, when we are trying to value an unlisted business, if we use the WAC of a similar listed company, we need to adjust for entity level differences between the two companies. Now, please note this is very important. If you calculate the WAC for the company that you are valuing, then obviously you don't adjust for entity level differences because that is the WAC for the company. However, if you use the WAC for a similar listed company, then you do need to adjust for entity level differences. So let's go back to the entity level differences that we covered at the beginning of our lecture. So please note these adjustments are made to the multiple, to the cost of equity, and to the WAC. So if we use the WAC of a similar listed company, we need to make these adjustments. Now please note the WAC is also a percentage. So your adjustment is going to work in exactly the same way as the cost of equity. If the company is more risky, we decrease the multiple, 
we increase the cost of equity and we also increase the WAC. On the other hand, if the company is less risky, we increase the multiple, we decrease the cost of equity, and we decrease the WAC. All right, so in all of these instances over here, wherever we are increasing the cost of equity, we are also increasing the WAC, because both of these are a percentage. So you can see that in the steps, if the company that we are valuing is more risky, then the WAC needs to be adjusted upwards because remember, your shareholders are going to want a higher return if the company is more risky. So if it's more risky, the WAC is adjusted upwards. On the other hand, if the company is less risky, investors will be prepared to accept a lower return on their investment so the WAC should then be adjusted downwards. All right, let's perform this calculation for our example. So remember, if we want to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, we need the cost of equity, the cost of preference shares, and the cost of debt. Once we have the cost of all of the individual types of finance, we will then wrap this up and calculate the weighted average cost of capital. Now remember, if the target capital structure of the company is given, you should use the target capital structure in order to get your weighting. Whereas if the target capital structure is not given, you are going to have to use market values to get your weighting. So you then also need to calculate the market value of equity, the market value of preference shares, and the market value of debt. Now in this question, we were given the target debt to equity ratio. Now, I just want to discuss this in a bit more detail. If you go back to your lecture notes, where we covered the analysis and interpretation of financial and non-financial information, we looked at these ratio calculations in detail. Please remember your debt to equity ratio means that there's two parts debt and three parts equity. Or in other words, it's debt over equity. But this does not tell me how much debt the company actually has in their capital structure. So it's preferable to rather work with a gearing ratio. Now how do I calculate my gearing ratio? Your gearing ratio is debt over debt plus equity. So if we want to calculate the gearing ratio for Avery Pty Limited, debt is 2 and equity is three. So that gives me an answer of 40%. Now this is much easier to work with because this tells me that the target capital structure of the company or the optimal capital structure is to have 40% debt and 60% equity, making up the total 100%. So I recommend if you are given a debt to equity ratio, you convert that into a gearing ratio and you rather work with the gearing ratio. So you can see that calculation just below. The target gearing ratio is 40%. So the target capital structure is 40% debt and 60% equity. So we will use that as our weighting in order to get the weighted average cost of capital. We now just need to calculate the cost of equity and the cost of debt. So we saw when we were reading through the information provided that we have enough information over here to calculate the cost of equity using the capital asset pricing model. So let's use this information, substitute it into the formula, and calculate the cost of equity. Now you'll remember I said to you when we looked at Gordon's dividend growth model, one limitation of using the capital asset pricing model to calculate the cost of equity is that smaller entities often obtain higher returns. 
So what we need to do is we need to adjust the cost of equity with a small stock premium in order to address this. So once we've calculated the cost of equity, we are going to add a small stock premium of 5%. How do I know that this is a smaller company? Well, first, you'll see when we complete the valuation that the market value of Avery PTY Limited is less than 250 million. And guys, most PTY Limiteds are going to have a value of less than 250 million. But I also said to you from an exam technique perspective, there's no negative marking. So if in doubt, add the 5% small stock premium. Okay, so to calculate our cost of equity, we take our risk-free rate of 9%, we add beta, and we multiply that by our market premium. So everything highlighted in yellow over there is my market premium. In this question, I was not given the market premium. I was given the market return of 18%. So I still need to deduct the risk-free rate so that I can get the market premium. Then in addition to that, we are going to add a 5% small stock premium. And that gives me a cost of equity of 27.5%. Next, we need to calculate the cost of debt. And you were actually given the cost of debt, so this is a very simple calculation. The interest rate on similar long-term borrowings is 15%. So please just remember when it comes to debt, interest is tax deductible. So because interest is tax deductible, we need our cost of debt after tax. So the tax rate in this question is 28%. So if I want the after-tax cost of debt, I'm just going to say 15% multiplied by 72%. So I now have my target capital structure. I have my cost of equity and my cost of debt. So I can calculate the weighted average cost of capital. So we take the cost of equity, we multiply that by 60%. We take the cost of debt and we multiply that by 40%. Add those two together and it gives me my weighted average cost of capital. Now please remember I said to you, if you have the weighted average cost of capital of a similar listed company, you need to adjust for entity level differences. However, in this question, all of the information specifically relates to Avery PTY Limited. So this is the WAC of Avery PTY Limited. So we do not need to adjust for entity level differences. So that deals with step one of the calculation. We can now move on to step two.